Well, good morning again. It feels like it's been a long time. I think probably because it has with the, the trip to Kenya and then us sharing about the trip last week. Um, but this morning, we're going to be back in the book of Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. We're going to be looking at chapter 21. So I, I want to encourage you to grab your Bible and open it up to Ezekiel 21 so that you can follow along. Now, if you're just joining us, or, or maybe like me, you just kind of struggle to remember things, let me remind you of a few things, okay? E Ezekiel, he is a prophet of God, and he is speaking God's message to God's people who are captives in Babylon. They're not in their home country. They're not where they belong, but they've been taken captive to a foreign country, to Babylon. And here's how things got to this sad state of affairs for God's people. If we go all the way back to King Solomon, remember King Solomon, despite his great, great wisdom, Solomon became entangled in idolatry. He, he built... Uh, temples for the many false gods of his many, many wives. And he began a pattern that the nation followed for hundreds of years. You know, we would be good to just stop right there and to realize that, that there is a difference between knowing the right answer and doing the right thing. Isn't that true? There is a difference between knowing what is right and doing what is right. Solomon knew. No one had more wisdom than Solomon. And yet no one acted like a bigger knucklehead. Building temple after temple for false gods. Well, after the death of Solomon, the nation divided. Remember that? And it divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, both of whom, by the way, continued in this pattern of rebellion against God, and they continued to give themselves to idolatry. In time, Israel was conquered by the nation of Assyria, a judgment from God upon them. And then a few hundred years later, Judah gets conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it is in the time of Judah's demise that Ezekiel the prophet writes. That's the setting for what we're going to read. Understand this though, the Babylonian army came to Jerusalem three separate times. The first time they took some of the royal family captive, including the prophet Daniel. And they established King Jehoiachin as a subject, a, a, a king under King Nebuchadnezzar. They came back a second time, though, when Jehoiachin rebelled. And that time, the Babylonians took Ezekiel and many others to be captives in Babylon, and they replaced the rebellious Jehoiachin with his uncle, a man by the name of Zedekiah. Now, eventually, though it has not happened yet where we pick up this morning, eventually the Babylonians will come a third time, and they will destroy all of Jerusalem including the temple of God. So Ezekiel the prophet, he is a captive there in Babylon, and he is speaking to fellow captives, and he is talking to them about the fact that God is doing all of this, that God himself is bringing punishment, he's bringing judgment upon Judah's idolatry and rebellion, their immorality. He's judging their stubborn and their often confronted sin, and he's judging it by bringing destruction upon the nation. But it isn't all doom and gloom. It isn't all doom and gloom. They're in the midst of what Ezekiel shares with us, and they're in the midst of what we read in chapter 21 this morning. There's hope. There's hope. Because God keeps his promises. And God not only keeps his promises to bring judgment when it is needed, but at the right time, he also keeps his promise to bring the Messiah and to rescue us all. So hopefully by now you've found Ezekiel. 
Um, now, this morning, though we are going to be spending most of our time in chapter 21, we are actually going to pick up in, in verse 45 of chapter 20. Uh, that's where we left off last time. And, and it's not just because we ran out of time. I want you to remember something. The chapter and the verse divisions that we find in Scripture they are not divinely inspired, okay? Understand this. They are simply very helpful tools. They, they allow us to navigate and to subdivide God's word more conveniently. But they were not put there by God himself. And in this case, we find that the last few verses of chapter 20 fit far better in the context of chapter 21. And so, and, and actually so much so that in the Hebrew Bible, uh, those last verses of chapter 20 are actually the first few verses of chapter 21. So let's begin with the last four verses of chapter 20. So find 21, back up four verses, and find yourself at verse 45. And there it says, and the word of the Lord came to me. So God's going to give his message again to Ezekiel. And he says, Son of man, set your face toward the southland and preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land in the Negeb. Say to the forest of the Negeb, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you. And it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. The blazing flame shall not be quenched. And all faces from south to north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I am the Lord, that I have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. And so here Ezekiel speaks an allegory. He uses a word picture as he often does. And in doing so, he announces God's imminent, in other words, coming at any moment, judgment upon his people. Now the Negev, this, this region that he keeps bringing up, it's that mountainous desert region that is just south of Jerusalem itself. It's an area that is very sparsely littered with desert trees, trees like the acacia or the tamarisk. It's a very dry and barren land. And so the Lord says, the judgment that I'm going to bring, the judgment that I'm bringing against my people, it's going to be like a fire that scorches an arid wilderness. It's going to devour not only the green, not only the dry trees, but the green trees as well. In other words, it's going to take it all. It's going to be complete. It's going to be final, and it will leave nothing behind but ashes. God's judgment will be comprehensive. It will be final. But then in, in verse 49, Ezekiel complains to the Lord. He says, Lord God, they are saying of me, is he not a maker of parables? Now, this is not the first time that, God, that Ezekiel has warned God's people about God's coming judgment. And it's not the first time that he has done so using an analogy or a word picture. And so it seems that the people are saying back to Ezekiel, listen, dude, you are nothing but a storyteller. Now, it's not exactly clear what they're saying. It could be that they're saying, listen, all you do is tell stories and no one knows what they mean. It could be that, but I think his stories are pointed enough. I think they're obvious enough that what they're really saying here is, listen, all you do is talk, talk, talk. You keep telling us that God's judgment is coming. But you know what? The sun came up yesterday, and it's going to come up tomorrow too. More than likely, what they're saying is you keep warning about God's judgment, but nothing ever comes of your stories. You know, dear friends, far too often, that is how we respond to God's grace. God warns us. He sends us a warning. He, he cautions us. He addresses some issue in our life. 
And then when he gives us grace, when he gives us room to repent, to turn to him, to, to turn back, when he gives us the space that is needed for us to come back to him, we interpret his grace as inaction or, inip or impotence. But dear friends, I promise you this. God always keeps his promises. He always holds to his word. And so the day will come. As it came for Judah, it will come for us. The day will come when God will show us just how wrong we are. He is not, in, he is not impotent. He is not inactive. He is just abounding in grace. Well, chapter 21 in response to the people telling Ezekiel that he's nothing but a storyteller. Hey, we read this, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem. Oh, now he's getting specific. And he says, and preach against the sanctuaries and prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the land of Israel, thus says the Lord, behold, I am against you. Oh, there's no word picture there. There's no analogy here. They were complaining that there were too many stories. So now Ezekiel is just saying it. God is coming after you. He says, I will draw my sword from its sheath and I will cut off from you both righteous and wicked. And so Ezekiel speaks very plainly. He tells them that the sword, that military defeat is coming to Jerusalem. There will be, he says, complete devastation. No one will escape because it is God himself, not just Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians who is coming against them. And notice this, verse 4, I will cut off from you both the righteous and the wicked. Therefore my sword shall be drawn from its sheath against all flesh from south to north and all flesh shall know that I am the Lord. I have drawn my sword from its sheath, and it shall not be sheathed again. And so the Lord says that this judgment will be final and that it will be complete. But, but notice this as well. God says that he's going to wipe out all of Jerusalem, both the righteous and the wicked. Does that give you pause? D does it make you ask the question, is that fair? Is that fair? Is God just if he wipes out the righteous along with the wicked? And what about what God said back in Ezekiel 18? Do you remember all the way back to Ezekiel 18? There, God talked about each person being responsible for their own sin. You can flip back there with me for a moment if you want. Look at chapter 18, verse 20. It sums it up very nicely for us. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So how can God be fair and still wipe out the whole city of Jerusalem? Well, here's what we've got to remember. Here's what we've got to, to keep in mind. And it's an unnatural thing for us to think about. It's an unnatural thing for us to keep in mind. But we've got to remember this. We all die. Every last one of us is going to die. It's not like just the wicked die, okay? And, and, and the people who are righteous, they just get older and older. And, wouldn't that be awful? It'd be enough to make you want to be wicked, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. That isn't how it works. We all die. And it is God who chooses when and how we die. No matter who you are, no matter how you live, it is the Lord who chooses when it is that we stand before him. And so, from the perspective of eternity, do this with me. I want you to view this from a perspective that we have not yet had. I want you to view this from the perspective from the other side of eternity. 
Because let me tell you this, the saved person will view their death as an act of mercy. No matter how it came. And no matter whether they died young or they died old, or whether they died suddenly or they saw it coming like a snail, they will view their death as an act of mercy because it is the thing that delivered them into the very presence of God. But the unsaved, the unsaved will view their death as an act of judgment no matter how it came to them. Whether they died young or old, fast or slow, their death from the perspective of the eternity of hell is that death will have been a judgment. Now it's this perspective. It's viewing this transition, this, this thing we call death. It's viewing it from the other side. It's viewing it from the perspective of eternity that allowed the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1. When he was facing the very real possibility, in fact, the very real probability that he was about to face a very unjust and violent end to his life at the hands of a Roman executioner, what did he have to say about it? He said this in verse 23, my desire is to depart. My desire, seriously. seriously. It's one thing to talk about that in a comfortable room with a warm cup of coffee. It's another thing when the Roman executioner is sharpening his blade. And yet Paul says, it's my desire to depart. Why? And to be with Christ. To be with Christ, for that is far better. Understand this, dear friends. Death is never a judgment. It is only delivery to either judgment or reward. Death is just a fact. It... it, it it happens to us all unless the rapture comes. It isn't judgment, but it is the mode of delivery that brings us either to judgment or to reward. And the timing of that delivery is always in God's hands. And so for these people living in Jerusalem in that day, whether they were to live long lives into their aged years or to die suddenly at the hands of the Babylonians. That's God's call. That's God's decision when to bring them to that place where they will face either judgment that is just or reward that is based on mercy. Verse 6, as for you, Son of man, groan with breaking heart and bitter grief, groan before their eyes. And when they say to you, why do you groan? You shall say, because of the news that is coming. Every heart will melt. All hands will be feeble. Every spirit will faint and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming. And it will be fulfilled, declares the Lord God. Now we can see two things here. Uh, first of all, the Lord is obviously emphasizing through Ezekiel the fact that this judgment will certainly take place. It's unavoidable. It's unstoppable. There is no way that it won't happen. And there is no way for any of them to escape it. That's the first thing that we can see. The second thing that we can see is this. That whole dynamic, that there is judgment coming to so many, for those of us who belong to Christ, that should break our hearts. It should cause us to groan. Dear friends, dear friends, we should never be arrogantly smug when we think of or speak of the judgment of those who have refused God's mercy. We should always 
we should always reflect the heart of our God who is not willing that any should perish. Dear friends, we should always be, a, be aware of the fact that the lost are receiving what you and I, in all honesty, deserve just as well. If it was not for the grace of God, we would be right there with them, wouldn't we? And like Ezekiel, we should groan. We should groan over the judgment of the lost. Our hearts should mirror the Lord's heart. Remember Ezekiel chapter 33? We've brought it up numerous times. There in verse 11, the Lord says this, As surely as I live, this is God speaking, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I take no pleasure in this. But rather that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. Turn. God is pleading with them. Turn, he says, from your evil ways. And, and dear friends, just like the Lord's heart, our hearts too should break for the lost and should plead with them to turn. Verse 8. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, say, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also polished, sharpened for slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Now much of this chapter is actually written as poetry. Ezekiel is painting a word picture, but it's not a beautiful picture, is it? It's a terrible picture. What he's writing here is really a lament. It's a sad and mournful picture of coming judgment. And as often the case with poetry, it's sometimes a bit hard to understand exactly what it is that he's saying. And that is certainly the case when we get to verse 10, a verse that universally translators find to be very, very difficult. In the ESV, it says this, shall we rejoice? Have you despised the rod, my son, with everything of wood? Now, the problem here is that in the original language, uh, the Hebrew is very sparse. They use very few words to say a, a whole lot. And Ezekiel is speaking very symbolically as well. So Ezekiel uses very few words to paint this picture and he leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Now most other translations um, take things in a bit different direction than the ESV does. Uh, the best of them quite honestly is probably the NIV. It puts it this way, shall we rejoice in the scepter of my royal son, the sword despises every such stick. So the ESV seems to assume that it is Israel who has despised the rod, uh, maybe a picture of God's discipline against them. And so because of that, now they get the sword. Now that makes sense. Uh, but the NIV, uh, the the, the Christian Standard Bible, the New Kings James, and many others, they go a different direction. They assume that it is the sword, that it is God's judgment that despises the king's scepter, the, the wooden scepter that he holds. And this gives us a picture of God's coming judgment that is going to extend even to the royal line of the kings of Judah. And that, my friends, fits far better in the context of what we're reading here. Look at verse 11 and on. So the sword is given to be polished that it may be grasped in the hand. It is sharpened and polished. It is given into the hand of the slayer. Cry out and wail, son of man, for it is against my people. It is against, catch this, all the princes of Israel. In other words, the royal line of the kings. They are delivered over to the sword with my people. Strike therefore upon your thigh, for it will not be a testing. What could it do if you despise the rod, declares the Lord God. Now that last verse, verse 13, uh, it also is very difficult for the translators. It, it goes back to the same terms and to the same dynamics that we saw in verse 10. Here I prefer the ESV's secondary or footnote reading. If you, if you have a footnote on that verse, it probably ha has some words at the bottom of the page that are similar to this. The CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, puts it this way. 
Surely it will be a trial. And what if the sword despises even the scepter? The scepter will not continue. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I, I think that nails it. I think that's exactly what, what Ezekiel is getting at here. In other words, what will happen if God judges even the kings? What, what if God removes the last king from the line of David? Ezekiel keeps saying that everyone in Jerusalem is going to be wiped out. Uh, but remember, remember this, God has previously promised to keep a son of David there upon the throne forever. So, what if God wipes out the line of the kings in this total judgment? Now, I want you to hold on to that question. And maybe to you, it, it, it doesn't sound like it's all that big of a deal. I promise you it is. It, it's a huge deal. It's actually the biggest part of what this chapter is about. And it matters. It matters because God has made a promise. And, and either we can trust God when he makes a promise to us, or we can't. And if we can't trust him, if we can't trust him in this, we can't trust him in anything. And it matters because it's not just about Judah's kings. It's about David's son. David's son, you know, the Messiah. It's about Jesus. And so, now that this question has been put forward, now that Ezekiel said, well, wait a minute, what if? Now Ezekiel is going to make sure that we know that God is going to do exactly what it is that he said he was going to do in regard to this judgment. Look at verse 14. As for you, son of man, prophesy. Clap your hands and let the sword come down twice. Yes, three times. The sword for those to be slain. It is the sword for the great slaughter which surrounds them that their hearts may melt and many stumble. At all their gates I have given the glittering sword. Ah, it is made like lightning. It is taken up for slaughter. Cut sharply to the right. Set yourself to the left. Wherever your face is directed, I also will clap my hands and will satisfy my fury. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, very likely here at this point, Ezekiel has once again uh, begun to act out his message from God. That's something that he has done uh, numerous times. So I picture Ezekiel there. He's now swinging his sword. He's making quite a scene. He's declaring God's message, and he's making sure that they know that this judgment will be complete and that it is unavoidable. It is coming. And God will do what it is that he has said that he will do. In fact, now Ezekiel lays out for us exactly what it's going to look like. Now look at there, verse 18. The word of the Lord came to me again. As for you, son of man, mark two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to come. Both of them shall come from the same land and make a signpost. Make it at the head of the way to a city. Mark a way for the sword to come to Rabbah of the Ammonites and to Judah into Jerusalem, the fortified. So Ezekiel describes Babylon's King Nebuchadnezzar coming to a fork in the road and choosing whether he will take the road and take his army to go to Jerusalem or whether he will take a different road and take his army to Rabbah of the Ammonites. And so verse 21, the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way at the head of the two ways to use divination. He shakes the arrows and consults the teraphim. He looks at the liver. Into the right hand comes the divination for Jerusalem to set battering rams, to open the mouth with murder, to lift up the voice with shouting, to set battering rams against the gates, to cast up mounds, to build siege towers. So Nebuchadnezzar comes to the fork in the road and he uses the typical pagan methods uh, for making a choice. He, he picks up by chance arrows uh, that are marked either for Jerusalem or for Rabbah. He consults with his little pocket-sized gods. Isn't that convenient? You can take them wherever you go because they're just so little, they fit right in your pocket, little teraphims. He even kills some poor animal and looks at its liver 
in order to get clues about which road he should take. And even though Nebuchadnezzar is using pagan ways, uh, ways that God quite clearly forbade his people to use, yet God being sovereign directs the Babylonians to take Jerusalem. And so Nebuchadnezzar and his army will go to Jerusalem and they will destroy it. They will lay siege to it. They will attack it. They will defeat its walls and break through its gates, destroying everything. And that is how it's going to happen. That is what will happen. The fire that he spoke about will scorch. The sword that he talked about, it will slaughter. Plain and simple, Nebuchadnezzar and his army are coming to destroy Jerusalem. But the Jews in Jerusalem, they see things differently. They still won't believe what Ezekiel is saying, what Jeremiah has been telling them as well. Look at verse 23. But to them, it will seem like a false divination. They don't want to believe it, so they just won't. They have sworn solemn oaths, and, but he brings their guilt to remembrance that they may be taken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your guilt to be remembered in that your transgressions are uncovered so that in all your deeds your sins appear, because you have come to, to remembrance, you shall be taken in hand. So those in Jerusalem, uh, they keep denying that, that this is going to happen, even though God has said uh, decisively that it will. Uh, their continuing sin, though, it, it is making it so that it is impossible for God to forget their guilt. They just keep piling up sin. And so now their, their guilt, it has to be dealt with, including the sin of King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah, who would become the last of the kings of Judah. Look at verse 25. And you, O profane wicked one. You ever kind of wonder if God has a nickname for you? Here's Zedekiah's nickname. O profane wicked one, prince of Israel, whose day has come, the time of your final punishment, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and bring low that which is exalted. A ruin, 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 I will make it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. So the kings of Judah are done. The Lord chooses to bring the line of the kings to an end with Zedekiah. Zedekiah, whom he calls, O profane, wicked one. So, do you wonder what it was about Zedekiah that God considered to be so very evil? I mean, you look at the history of the kings, and quite honestly, Zedekiah was not aggressively evil like King Manasseh had been. You know, Manasseh, he's, he's out there sacrificing his own children to Molech. Zedekiah, Zedekiah didn't oppose God the way King Jehoiakim had. Jehoiakim, he persecuted and murdered God's servants. He even, Jeremiah the prophet sent him a message from God one time. So you know what Jehoiakim did? He burned it in the fireplace. He said, God, this is what I think of your message. I'm just going to use it to, to warm myself by the fire. And yet, God ends it all with Zedekiah. Zedekiah, it's interesting. His name means God is righteous or justice of God, righteousness of God. And yet God calls him profane, wicked one. You see, Zedekiah had the name, God's righteousness, but he didn't have the reality. Zedekiah was, he was rather passive in his wickedness. You might even say that it was his weakness that made him wicked. Uh, when Zedekiah was confronted with, with evil, he just went with the crowd. He chose not to stand against them. 
As Zedekiah didn't burn his children on Molech's altar, he didn't burn God's word in his fireplace. But you know what? He didn't love the Lord either. And so, he was wicked. Understand what I'm saying here. You don't have to be Manasseh or Jehoiakim to be evil. You don't have to be openly fighting against God or, or somehow in some vulgar way worshiping pagan idols. You can simply be coasting along doing your thing. You can keep the name Christian, but never experience the, the reality of it. And here's why. We are all sinners. Dear friends, it's not just those who sin brazenly who need a Savior. It is every last one of us. We are all in need of forgiveness and cleansing, and, and that is something that we can only get from Jesus. Only from Jesus. Every last one of us needs to know not just about salvation, but we need to be saved. We need to be cleansed by the blood of Christ. We need to be claimed as his by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. We need to be transformed by the living out of our new identity in Christ. Salvation is not about attendance. It isn't about appearances. It isn't even about improved morality. It isn't even about believing about Jesus. It's about giving yourself to him in reality. It's about the very real exchange of our sin for his righteousness. It's about the very practical exchange of our condemned life for his resurrection life. You see, Zedekiah took the name of God's righteousness, but he never gave himself to God. And so he, like all of us, was, O oh, profane, wicked one. And the kings ended. Verse 27 tells us that that would be the case until the one to whom all judgment belongs appears. The one to whom all judgment belongs. Now, to whom does all judgment belong? Oh, that's Jesus, isn't it? It's until Jesus comes. And that's what Ezekiel's talking about. Until Jesus, who, who lived in perfect righteousness and yet died for our sin, he, he is the one who will wear the crown again. And not just the crown of the kings of Judah, but he will wear a crown as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Now Ezekiel makes one more point here. Beginning in verse 28, he says, And you, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God concerning the Ammonites. Well, wait a minute. The Ammonites, what do they have to do with this? They were the road that Nebuchadnezzar did not choose. Ezekiel says concerning the Ammonites and their reproach. The road that, that Nebuchadnezzar didn't pick when he chose to go to Jerusalem and to attack and to destroy that. Understand this. Here's what the Lord is saying is eventually Nebuchadnezzar will get to that place too. God's judgment will come there as well. Look part way through verse 28. A sword, a sword is drawn for the slaughter. It is polished to consume and to flash like lightning. While they see for you false visions, while they divine lies for you, to place you on the necks of the profane wicked whose day has come, the time of their final punishment. Here's what Ezekiel is saying. No one is exempt from God's judgment. 
Uh, maybe you, you sit there this morning and you think, wow, <laughs> I don't believe any of this. And I'm so glad that I'm not under that. Wow, that, that'd be such a bummer. Guess what? Whether you believe it or not doesn't change reality. God made us all. We all belong to him. And so it is by him that we will all be judged. The Jews, the Ammonites, oh, even the Babylonians, even the Babylonians, even the, the, the ones that God was using to bring his judgment, they too will be judged by God. The sword itself will be brought to justice. Verse 30, return it to its sheath like a tool being put away when it is done. In the place where you were created, in the land of your origin, I will judge you. And I will pour out my indignation upon you. I will blow upon you with the fire of my wrath, and I will deliver you into the hands of brutish men, skillful to destroy. You shall be fuel for the fire. Your blood shall be in the midst of the land, and you shall be no more remembered, for I, the Lord, have spoken. And so Ezekiel ends, he ends this chapter on a note of severe judgment. But dear friends, that doesn't have to be how things end for any of us. Uh, the Jews, the Ammonites, even the Babylonians, any one of them could have surrendered themselves to God at any point. And in an instant, God would then change their eternal destiny. And that is true of us today. Are you openly, brazenly giving yourself to sin? Here's the answer. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Are, are you hostile towards God? opposing him at every turn. Here's the answer. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus before, before judgment comes. Do you bear the name Christian, but no more than the name? Here's the answer. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Are you tired of carrying your sin? Are you tired of bearing guilt? Listen to the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, our Savior says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you, he says. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. The Savior offers us grace. He says to, to any, to any who have not exchanged their life for his, that the offer is still extended. The opportunity still exists. But judgment will come. Ezekiel won't let us forget that, will he? We are guilty. I am guilty. I need the grace of God. I need to exchange my life for his. My sin for his righteousness. So do we all. So do we all. Are you tired this morning from bearing the weight of sin, the burden of guilt? Why carry it any longer when the Savior offers to take it for you? Turn to him. He is not willing that any should perish, but all will come to repentance. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hope 
of the coming of the Messiah, even in the midst of the, uh, a chapter that, uh, that makes so clear that judgment is coming. God, that is not our only option. God, we will never measure up, not on our own. And so we come to you. We come to Jesus. And we surrender ourselves. God, we give you our, our condemned lives and we receive as a free gift the measure of your glory, of your grace, of your mercy, that you would give us resurrection life. God, we desire not to be Christians in name, but to walk in the reality of an exchanged life. To have your Holy Spirit active and working within our lives. Changing us, transforming us, empowering us. That is our desire, Lord. God, I pray for any this morning who they just recognize that, that they have never had that exchange with you. They have never surrendered themselves. And, and this morning, I invite you to do that. Where you are, as you are, to give yourself unreservedly to him. Surrender your condemned and guilty life and receive his forgiveness, his mercy, in the transformation of resurrection life, the indwelling of his Holy Spirit to shape, to form, to embolden you. God, I pray that you would work that within our hearts this morning, each and every one. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.